Welcome everybody uh, to our part two of our uh, safety webinars that we're putting on as you, some of you are on in, in our first one. We had so much to cover and we had a lot of great participation that we decided to break it up into a series of three or four webinars. So this is part two. And to, tonight we have more members of the safety committee joining us. We have Catherine Labine, who will um, be starting off our webinar tonight. We also have Matt Logue and Tony Martinez, who is a new member of uh, the safety committee. Um, I am the head coach of uh, the Martha's Moms rowing team. I'm also a US rowing referee and a FISA umpire. And safety has been a passion of mine for a number of years. And so uh, being able to be here tonight and share what we've learned, what we know, some best practices, and just have a good interaction with you, uh, we're pretty excited about that. So I wanna um, have Catherine, can you introduce yourselves and, and then uh, turn it over to say Tony or Matt uh, for a quick introduction? Sure, no problem. Uh, my name's uh, Catherine Levine and I uh, am a coach at uh, Maritime Rowing uh, Club in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, coach high school girls primarily and um, have been a safety committee member since 2015 and um, have uh, also in the past been a U.S. rowing referee and safety again uh, uh, came on board because uh, had a few things happen uh, out on the water that uh, woke me up and caused me to uh, pay more attention and realize that uh, I needed to educate myself and come on board to the committee and do what I can to help other people get their programs up to spec. Uh, do you want to go around Robin here, or you want me to just get right in, with Rachel? Whatever uh, you want to do. Yeah. So Tony, why don't you go ahead and, and give an introduction and and your role in rowing and and why you joined the safety committee? Okay. Well, I've been rowing. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, I've been rowing for the last twenty two years and started with my daughter early on in high school and um, just really loved the sport when I watched it, but. What concerned me always was the safety that was happening in a brand new club with people unknowing about safety and water and wind and weather conditions. And fortunately, we're on a small lake, but there's still conditions that you have to worry about, whether you're on or off the lake. And I um, be quickly became part of our safety committee at our, our lake and we developed our rules or our guidelines by what we wanted people to know and to be aware of when they were out in the water. And those regulations are still in part at least um, accurate today. Again, there's always the need to keep updating with our life changing as it is. So that's why I'm here is to find out what's happening in other places and hopefully to add some about what happens in our area. Perfect. Thank you. And welcome, Tony. Matt? Thank you. Um, I'm Matt Logue. I'm the executive director at Three Rivers Rowing in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, been involved with rowing here in Pittsburgh for since 2019. Spent five years in New York City on a variety of different bodies of water, but and originally from Buffalo, New York, um, rowing up on a couple different bodies of water is there. So safety's always been at the forefront of my job and my responsibility. And it's something that I'm pretty passionate about being proactive with and making sure that we're doing what we can as rowing leaders to keep safety at top of mind for all people at all times uh, to advance our sport. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, I'll turn it back over to you to kind of maybe give the logistics, uh, how you want people to interact, uh, the information that might happen uh, anywhere from <laughs> 45 minutes past the hour to, to the hour. So go ahead, Chris. All right. Um, so uh, just trying to figure out the presenter's mode on this. Uh, a couple of things, everybody. We uh, have a busy week for the Zoom channel here. Um, so uh, DEI committee has a meeting ex immediately after this one. When somebody opens that window, we are instantly out. So um, something to know is, I put in the in the um, into the, to the notes here, into the chat room the original safety video that we did in May, Rachel with Rachel and Matt and everybody, and there's a link there to it. Can you guys see it all? And then. Um, so it should be right there. And then the other thing is anything that's on this PowerPoint, including the PowerPoint is in a Google Drive. And uh, no matter what time we get booted, you'll have access to everything that made up the Google, this uh, PowerPoint. So you can go there on your own time and see it. And it's just lots of stuff to look at. 
So okay. uh, Matt, I'm gonna to try to uh, do this again here and see what we can do, right? Uh, and share this document. Um, this isn't the, uh, this isn't the one we had as a Matt. Matt and I had figured out how to do presenters mode before, <laughs> and I'm not sure we can duplicate the effort and get it going. Um, um, so the, Chris, before you go into that though, um, I just wanna um, turn it over to Catherine for kind of the lead-in of tonight's um, webinar, and then we'll we'll kind of go from there. Is that okay, okay Chris? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think given the time constraints and possibility of getting kicked out of our Zoom, I want to try and keep it pretty tight. Uh, and there's a whole lot of information that our presenters have for you this evening. So uh, really, I think a good place to start tonight is with a meta query that really can and should drive the rest of the conversation. Um, as a, an administrator, uh, a head coach, a board member, there are some questions you really be, ought to be asking about your organization. And you can start with what or who are you as a rowing organization? Uh, what's the service that you provide? Who's your target audience? Uh, what are your organization's values? Uh, I could go on and on, uh, but I'm sure many of you recognize that these questions are the components of an organization that is in the process of developing its mission statement. Uh, for every club, obviously, it's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, a lot of you out there are involved in high performance programs. Uh, many of you are uh, involved in outreach programs. It's all good, all relevant, uh, all admirable. But what I wanna put out there is that there is one question that all of you and all of us ought to be asking ourselves as rowing organizations. And that is this, are your safety systems your top priority? Um, are they the best practices that are available with the most current information that is available? Uh, so really what it comes down to is you need to ask yourselves, uh, all of you, what should your mission statement contain? Uh, all of the aforementioned questions, plus a statement about your uh, club's commitment to safety ought to be in your mission statement. Uh, really, safety ought to be uh, entwined. It ought to be an integral part of the DNA of your organization. Uh, now COVID, uh, as devastating as it has been for all of us, uh, has really forced us all to hit the pause button on programs and plans. Uh, you can view it, however, as the opportunity for all of us to uh, review and update our missions and our best practices. Uh, the committee members uh, often hear from member organizations when they have safety questions, and Rachel and any of the members can go into that in more detail later. Uh, but a common question, a common concern that arises is when long-term members, you know, our old timers, uh, sometimes they tend to be resistant to change. And here's really what I'm proposing is that if it is that you are reviewing and updating your club's mission statement uh, to include your commitment to best safety practices, that is your first line of defense against resistance. Uh, there are other methods that we'll go into later. Uh, but you're going to hear a lot tonight about administrators' roles in safety, safety plans, uh, traffic patterns, et cetera. But the one thing that I do want to uh, mention and uh, recommend is that each organization uh, have a designated safety officer. Now, uh, we all probably have safety committees within our organizations. Uh, the officer is really somebody whose uh, focus can, in addition to all the other duties, really uh, be about making sure that everything is up to date. Uh, and by that, I mean equipment, but also practices, policies, plans, et cetera. Uh, because if there's really not one person in your organization focused on safety, uh, it, things will slip through the cracks. I've seen it. It's happened to me at places I've been. I'm sure we could all tell stories about that. Like I said, really, your safety officer can take charge of uh, keeping equipment up to date, uh, 
really one of the important things that I think a safety officer can do is schedule training. Uh, training uh, clinics for your staff and your coaches. Uh, at Maritime, I'm the safety officer, and recently I ran a clinic about how to use the new safety straps. If you have been listening and uh, viewing the uh, webinars that have been offered on safety recently, you have probably come across what is called wet training, which is water emergency training. It'll be discussed a little bit later in the webinar, I'm sure. Uh, but I made sure that each and every one of our coaches uh, really had the opportunity to try out straps, uh, try to rescue, you know, to simulate a rescue of an incapacitated rower from a boat. Uh, if you have been a coach for any period of time, you've probably come across this. It's important that you know how to get somebody out of a boat. And really, these are uh, these functions are most effective when they're implemented with the support uh, from either your board or your administrators, however it is that your organization works. Uh, so really, that's just the intro. Uh, Chris, I think it's a good opportunity probably to segue to uh, Matt's discussion about uh, administrative uh, stuff. So I'll throw it back to you. All right, a uh, couple of things, everybody. Let's just see here. Um, First things first, um, in terms of the content is, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to get out of this mode and it's really, you got my notes down here. Uh, we will get all the COVID stuff out. Uh, we are updating um, all of the things that at US Rowing right now, we have so many different groups that we have to work with. So that should be out sooner than later as we enter the fall season. And at the back here, you're gonna see a lot of resources. So should we get cut out first, please know that there's a lot of stuff on here um, and links to all the different things. So here's the wet training that Catherine was uh, talking about here. And you'll find videos on all the things that she was talking about. And then we will, you know, you'll see different aspects of this uh, that you can click into any of these later on. Um, now getting into it, um, what we have is, uh, and Catherine, I think we are gonna talk some, a little bit about the risk management and negligence part. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so um, what you're gonna see here, everybody who's listening is, there's a lot of stuff in here. We don't intend in to get into the minutia of each of these slides. What we wanted to do was give them to you as resources so that you could take them and compare them to what you have now and what you could have, or maybe your circumstances are different and you have different things that you need. Um, so we're gonna touch bait, we're gonna touch on them a little bit, uh, but we won't go into every single one in the essence of time, especially since we have the, you know, <laughs> the impending hook coming at us. Um, uh, to start things off with, uh, we thought that it would be important to remind everybody what is your most important uh, aspect of your job. And Catherine just did a great job talking about that. You know, at the, the beginning of every conversation should be safety. Before you launch, before you go to a race, when you're at, I mean, everything is always, should be revolve around keeping the, you know, everybody involved safe, right? So there are risks. Every day we take risk. Our sport is an unkind sport and so are the conditions. Uh, Catherine, did you want to talk a little bit about um, risk management and, and negligence? I mean, well, I can, um, and I think that we could uh, certainly get contribution from uh, the rest of uh, the group here because we all have a, a different view. Uh, I think the all have the same uh, meta view, but uh, you know, different experiences. Really, honestly, when it comes down to it, uh, coaches, administrators, uh, we are um, uh, responsible for people's uh, safety, welfare, and even their lives. And so uh, to, and if you just glance at this uh, slide here, reasonable care is uh, something that should be absolutely floating through your mind uh, at all times because uh, you, you really need to understand that uh, the accidents that happen, uh, often it is, is when uh, we uh, drop the ball on uh, our best practices. And uh, sincerely, uh, it is in your best interest as a coach, it's in the best interest of your athletes, it's in everyone's best interest. Everyone's gonna have a better experience uh, and uh, all the competitive aspects of your training plan can be accomplished even with this as being your uh, prime directive. So anybody else wanna jump in? 
I on. think, you know, Steve Hargis is a, Steve Hargis was a guy I worked with for a long time and he's a big part of rowing. He once said he's also an athletic director at a school. And he once said, uh, he once told me that standard care is the base level, right? When you work with young people, the mm -hmm. expectations on you are so much higher than the standard level of care. And so that, I mean, you have, a, you know, not that you want to drop the ball anywhere, but when you're working and the vast majority of our sport is young people, right? So uh, keeping that in mind that standard care, much even more is expected out of you when you're dealing with minors. Um, moving into this, uh, our level three, one of the things that it's done is expanded um, how we teach and, and what people learn. And this came from the level three uh, with Brett, uh, Brett Gorman's on here and Cam isn't on here tonight. He's, he was double booked as well. But we asked the candidates, we asked the students for, and that are in level three, we asked them to come up with their own and, um, and is it good enough? How, how extensive is it? And I thought these were some of the really great questions that they would ask. How do you update it? I mean, is it something you do once and never look at it again? How do you update it? Um, who updates the plan? How regularly? How do you share your plan with your members? I mean, if you have a, a boathouse with 400, Matt, you have what, 400 or so people in your boathouse? Like, how do you know, the buck stops with you, right, Matt? Like, how do you know that everybody sees this? And we'll get to the answer to that later on because it's actually on his website. Um, you need to make sure that everybody sees it. Um, but these questions are really important that you answer. You don't just do this once and forget about it. Like, how regularly do you, do up, do you update things? And when new information comes along, how often do you add that in? Um, and then how do you assess, you know, who, who knows what, how do you, how do you assess if your coaches know what's happening? Um, moving right along, uh, one of the, one of the things that's suggested is have preseason coaches meetings. Now this is important in-house, right? I mean, we talked about this last night, Catherine and Rachel, like it's important mm -hmm. that you get everybody on the same page. I think Rachel used that term, getting every, make sure everybody's on the same page. But if you share the body of water with multiple boathouses, now it's that times how many boathouses, how many more coaches. So uh, what we did is we, we, we bulleted some, some items that we think are important that you need to ask and make sure that you're, everybody's on the same page for the emergency plan uh, and review them within, but also review them with everybody else who is sharing the, the body of water with you. And then all that information has to get down to the athletes as well. Um, First we talked about leave, one, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before you leave this page, yeah. Um, the, what, what we're finding in the Pacific Northwest anyways is as a result of having to take a year off, um, we're finding a lot of our longer time coaches, uh, maybe three to four year coaches that have been in the area for a while um, have moved on, uh, either uh, taken on new professions or um, moved somewhere else. And so we're seeing a lot of new coaches on the water. And that's why we really think it's important to take that into consideration and, and maybe uh, form this community uh, to, to have these meetings, to have these conversations so that all boathouses have an understanding of traffic pattern, all boathouses have an understanding of when you're gonna be, you know, what's your general practice plan, where you're gonna be. So keep in mind that at least in the Pacific Northwest, I'm seeing a lot of new coaches on the water and it just makes it that much more important that uh, we <clears throat> communicate as a community to stay safe. Yeah, Catherine, you were saying how many crews are on your river back at home? One, yeah, at one point, uh, the Norwalk River, it's about 2,000 meters really on the river. We have a harbor that we go into, but uh, at one point we had five clubs. We now have four operating at the same time. Large programs in the Northeast. It's very competitive, a lot, a lot, a lot of rowing programs. And um, I think it was back in 2014 that um, we we had grown to the point where we decided uh, collectively that we had to get together and agree on traffic patterns. And so what we have done is uh, named our organization, the uh, Consortium of uh, Norwalk River Rowing, uh, uh, of Rowing Clubs. And so it is that we meet at least once a year. Uh, we do communicate more, but I see like this uh, Three Rivers uh, traffic pattern map that's up right now. We have something similar and uh, we talk about it and uh, from year to year changes a little bit, uh, conditions change. It is one of those things that you need to revisit on a regular basis. It isn't a one and done. So, uh, you know, things happen on the river, there's construction, there's this, there's that. We have in on the Norwalk River, 
uh, there is the uh, railroad, it is the North, Northeast Corridor Railroad, there is a swing bridge uh, that goes over the Norwalk River that's over 100 years old, and they are in the process of replacing it. There's constant information that we need to communicate amongst the clubs about uh, how it is that we need to avoid uh, construction and all those sorts of things. And without that sort of consortium, uh, we'd be fighting all the time. And that's the truth of it. So uh, it's important that you get on to the same page. You know, another aspect to think about is I was in Cleveland a couple of weeks ago and I, we, I ate right on the waterfront. And all of a sudden, all these rowers came out of everywhere. But so did kayakers and paddle boarders and canoes in the, the is it Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga River. Like it was so packed. And then these big barges started coming down the river. And you're like, who coordinates? all of that traffic. It's not just like, like we're thinking rowers, right? But you have all kinds of traffic and all kinds of uh, people who use the same. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's probably a good practice to also reach out to anybody else who would use it for other reasons. And because you share the water, right? So, um, all right, moving along. What you're gonna see here, guys, is a couple of, um, of checklists that we put together. Again, uh, it doesn't mean that this is everything but it also is a good starting point. So we, we put together some things. You'll find these in, in, the, in the, uh, the Google um, folder. You know, um, what should be you be doing with your, with your launches, right? What should you have in them in, from the sense of uh, emergency stuff? Um, are they set up with lights and are they set up with working batteries? And do you have all the things you need? Do you have rope and anchors and all the things that you need? Um, are they registered? You know, um, and so on. And then this is a this is a safety list uh, for the box that you keep all your stuff in. Do you have everything? Do you have the flares? And many of the states have rules, right? The things that you must have in your launch if you're going to be out there. We're heading into the the um, the fall. We're going to lose light, especially up here in the north. I mean, the light goes so fast. Are your masters out there after dark? Are they out there in the morning before the sun comes up? What are those things, Rachel? You have you're an area that is filled with masters rowing filled and people have been doing it. You know, they rode with Noah, right? Like you've got people that have done it that way forever. Like, how do you, how do you interact with all of the people who are going to go out in that water? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's a lot of communication. And if we can't get together off the water, we at least communicate what like coaches will come together from different boat houses while we're on the water. Uh, to communicate what we're doing in that day. So like, for instance, last week I was seat racing. And I was just letting all the people know that we're going to be in the Fremont Canal, that we were seat racing for the day and everybody was very kind and watched their wakes and kind of let, let us have that time. If we communicate with each other, we can be safer. And, and um, so, so we're doing that, you know, quite a bit. We have to do it even more. And this is something that um, you've got the list there of things to have in. One of them is like the phone numbers for um, yep. your local police, whatever that can be. And it became more important uh, here in Washington state and particularly in, in uh, Seattle, Washington. I don't know if any of you have been following the, the politics of our city, but we uh, defunded the police. And so our Harbor Patrol, which is normally out there that we see you know, two boats out every morning, we don't see them anymore. Now, while they will respond, the response times are quite uh, extended. And so understanding that and coming up with different ways to make sure we're communicating and, and um, asking other boat houses to help in an emergency and things like that. Uh, those are contingencies that, that at least I put on my launch. Um, and one more thing about this list is if you have a locked box, so like we leave all of our stuff in boxes on our launches and they're locked. Well, um, yeah, that's uh, great when you have the key for the locked box and you have an emergency. And, and I had the need the other day to try to get in to a launch I'm not familiar with, or well, not that I don't normally drive. And there was not a key on the ring for the box itself. Um, thankfully, I carry a backpack with some of my own rescue gear in it. And so I was able to get in there and get what I needed. But if you have a locked box on your launch, make sure you can open it when you're so, in the uh, Three things also about this list. You know, like I think we all use the first aid kits for band-aids or what have you, right? And, mm -hmm. But do we? But restocking them seems to be the problem, right? We we use them the right. first time around, and then uh, you know, like you're out three miles away from the dock, and then you get back and you, things happen, and next thing you know, you're out of stuff in there. Um, yeah. Life yeah. jackets, a little known. I don't know how many people know that life jackets have a shelf life. 
Mm -hmm. um, and after a certain amount of time, they're no longer usable. And so that's something, you know, they could be out of, uh, out of time or out of, you know, use. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is the kill switches aren't just something we're suggesting that you should have. Kill switches are now a Coast Guard regulation. Everyone has to have one. It's not an if you want to or if you and remember to. And wear it. And wear it. Yeah, exactly. And and unfortunately, we've learned that the hard way in our sport, haven't we? Uh, yep. With with somebody um, in the Mid Atlantic, um, sadly. So I mean, this again, this is just a starting point. Um, there are things. Coast Guard has a set of rules and regulations of things you must have on your boat on your launch. Um, another one. This is just a simple one on how to take care of your engine. If you're young, if you're teaching your young coaches how to do this, the longevity, like we're rough on engines, right? I mean, you know, they weren't made for rowing teams. I'll tell you that. Um, so um, no. just before you move on, just, oh. just that note on Coast Guard. So on the US Rowing website, if you go into the safety page, there's a, there's a bunch of links to safety resources. And one of those resources is uh, uh, an up-to-date Coast Guard um, pamphlet and within that Coast Guard pamphlet, there is very good information about what is and is not required, um, uh, particularly as it pertains to life jackets. So if that question were to come up, um, we're going to point people to that Coast Guard link um, that is also on our website. You know, Rachel, that you bring up another good point, and that is the committee, for those of you listening, the committee did a great job of redoing the safety page on the U.S. rowing page. And a lot of times I'll get questions and I'll be like, that's on the that's on the website, you know. Like I, I think we've gotten away from looking at the website. But the safety committee's done a great job of revamping that page, and there's a lot of information on there that is practical that you can use every day. And so I encourage everybody to go and check that out. And remember, if you're using U.S. Rowing Insurance, it's tied to the expectations on that page. There are things like you cannot leave juniors alone, on you know, untended. Like you have to have a launch with them. These are things that are on page that are really important to know and, and remember um, as members. Um, so we're, we're at the point now we're going to talk about weather a little bit. And this is the Three Rivers page. And you, what you'll see here is a collection of a lot of pertinent information. And where we're going to go with this is that Matt Logue, who is the executive director of Three Rivers, has all this information. But you can see he's got it for dragon boats. He's got it for new ca canoe and kayaks. He's got everything from flow to water temperature to wind speed, and he puts it all together and he made a matrix. So the, uh, the thing, the most important, I, it's all so important, but the thing that was great and mad about yours is you made it that you are the final say. You're not gonna have a bunch of 20 somethings on the dock arguing on whether or not you should go out or not, right? You made this a matrix and you put it all together. And, um, and to show this, I think I'm going to have to actually show it, aren't I, Matt? Uh, so if, Matt, would you mind explaining to everybody um, what your matrix is and, um, and how it works? Hold on, I'm gonna share it, guys. Uh, and, and, and how it is that you, as the administrator, make sure that everybody follows it. Um, here we go. So Matt, why don't you give us a walkthrough on, on your matrix and how it all goes together? Yeah, for sure. And this is, I mean, I hats off to a lot of the safety officers at Three Rivers and the, and the coaches that created this before I got to Three Rivers. Uh, we have definitely, it's been a living document for over 15 years at the organization and constantly being updated with new pertinent information uh, year in and year out. We review this document as a safety committee annually and as needed. Um, so if something comes up in between new information, new technology, new resources, things that make us want to relook at it, any aspect of it, um, we review this pretty regularly as a committee. And then as far as sharing this, we we host multiple safety meetings per year. There are two that are manda mandatory, one in the spring, one in the fall. And then we work on trying to make this uh, safety a very conversation we want safety to be conversational at three rivers we don't want it to be foreign or siloed or anything like that or where anybody has the opportunity to kind of go off as with the ignorance is bliss approach to operations we want it to be conversational we want and i try to make myself and our safety committees very approachable um, to for, to our membership and our community to ask questions and and get further explanations on that and what we've been trying to do is to simplify it over the number of different factors that we encounter could encounter on a daily basis. 
So we row on a commercial river um, in, here in Pittsburgh. We have giant coal barges. We have river tour boats. We have recreational power boats. We have jet skis. We have kayaks. We have paddle boarders. We have dragon boats. We have rowing shells. And we have a river that changes speed based on how much water is flowing through it at any given time that can be dictated by rainfall, snow melt, or if the Corps of Engineers decides to open a dam a few miles north of us. So a lot of different things come into play. The two guiding factors are right up there at the top which are water flow and water temperature. Um, we have spent countless times trying to come up with a wind chill and adding things in, but it always comes back to these being the core uh, and most uh, well-defined components of the program, of the matrix. And then you'll see we have five zones on there and every row below it has detail as to what the ratio, uh, uh, what the safety requirements are and who is allowed to row in the given zones. Um, so you'll see row three, shell type, all boats can row in zone one, only eights and quads can row in zone five. Um, and it kind of works that way all the way down. Uh, we have, you know, PDF requirement, an entire section on PDF requirements. Um, we have an entire, there's a line on uh, skill level of crew and launch ratio to crews. So we have the same rule that you were just mentioning, Chris, uh, no youth programs. All youth have to have launches at all times, uh, but the ratio of um, boat size and number of boats per launch changes by zone based on increasing risk factor. Zone five is also very unique for our organization. So, um, and, and so in order to row in zone five, you can't just look at it and say, okay, the flows between 50 and 60,000 CFS. I'm going to follow all of that. In addition to that, every program needs to have a meeting with their athletes. And if it's a youth program, parents have to be a part of that meeting to go over specific zone five safety procedures that includes keeping an extra launch gassed and ready on the dock, having an emergency contact binder at the ready at the boathouse. Um, and if they're a youth athlete, the parents have to sign a zone five waiver no, so that um, they're aware of the risks potential risk of rowing in zone five. So we take that extra step just to highlight um, uh, the other, you know, the, the factors that do come into that zone. Um, obviously, like we, we get a lot of questions on this every once in a while, but it has been tried and true. Um, and we do not stray from the safety matrix in any situation um, for any reason. We are hosting head of the Ohio, but if it's, if, the, if we're in a, um, zone four and the water's under 50 degrees, we will cancel head of the Ohio, um, you know, for safety reasons. Um, you know, we're, we live very strictly by this document, but we are also very open to feedback on this document and we'll take any questions and considerations seriously. So um, it's, again, trying to make it conversational, uh, trying to balance it between middle school programming and master's programming and making sure that, you know, it's not overly restrictive to one versus the other, that everybody um, at, their at the various skill levels have the opportunity to maximize safe rowing. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a constant challenge, but it's an incredible document that I really give hats off to the, to my predecessors for putting together um, and that we are doing it you know, it, it starts a conversation. And when, when safety is a conversation and people are thinking and learning from it, it keeps it top of mind. And, and I know that people are being safe out on the water. I like Matt, there's a couple of things in here that stick out as well is, you know, like we all want to get on the water and, and, and coach and row and all that. I like the little things like, you know, uh, through November 1st to April 30th, like many states have laws that you have to have a life jacket on depending on the length of your boat and the size of your boat. You know, and, and here in Saratoga, the sheriff will stop you if you're rowing a single and check to see if you have a, uh, a life jacket underneath your foot stretcher. You have to have one. Uh, little things like P, uh, PFDs to be worn at all times in all zones within the launches, right? I like that you're proactive and do stuff like that. I think those are, um, uh, are, are really important aspects that we tend to, to forget sometimes. Um, I'm going to guess, do you guys mind if I take some of these, some of these questions? There might be questions, Matt, because um, sure. I'm sharing. Uh, should we receive? Let me know. Um, okay. All right. So, so I, I was making sure that there weren't anything up there in the questions that uh, you had for Matt. If anybody does pop those in, uh, until then, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. 
Um, yep, I've been monitoring it and I'll throw some things in um, as, as stuff comes up. Awesome, uh, Terry, awesome. Terry down in Sarasota was uh, uh, mentioning about a new product coming out, wireless kill switches. They're going to be testing them. They'll let us know how it goes. So, uh, you know, anybody that has anything like that. And then, uh, Terry, you also shared um, uh, you, you shared the link for that product. I put some things out there about straps. So if you guys have anything like that, go ahead and, and drop them into the chat box for all of us to, uh, to be able to access and use. I got to tell you, Terry is something else the way he keeps Venice and Park rolling along down there. He is yep. on top of uh, cutting edge uh, safety. Um, yep. Uh, other things that I noticed on here, Matt, uh, you have incident uh, report forms. I think those are really important, and a lot of people are like, oh, we had a problem out there. Well, you should be documenting it, right? That's a that's a big part of this. Um, swim tests and uh, safety video. A big shout out to the U.S. Running Safety Video, legendary, I think, in our sport. Uh, but you also have in here things like that are mandatory, right? You have your safety you have your safety plan up here, and you also have who has to review it. I see up here twice a year. You, you, you call out coaches, scholars, kayakers, any steer people and coxswains have to review the, the material twice a year. Uh, very proactive, good stuff. Um, the next couple of things, everybody, are things that go in that are just factors into these kinds of plans. If you go, if you were to put in, you know, cold water survival time, or you were to pull in different aspects of, of safety into Google, it comes up with all kinds of stuff. These are the kinds of charts that could be in the boathouses, right? Let people know what we're up against. Um, this one is hypothermia rates. This one is wind chill. Up here in the Northeast, you know, in, in the Adirondacks, wind chill is a, is a real thing once we get into October and November. Um, flow charts, any rivers that have flow. Uh, I put the website down here. So when you guys are reviewing this later on, the website for, uh, for NOAA is on there and you can put in where you're at anywhere in the country and it'll give you this kind of chart for the river that you may be on. And um, what else we have here? Uh, temperatures, understanding hypothermia. You know, what are the warning signs? So I, did, I put this little chart here that I found. You can actually take this off uh, when you get the, the PowerPoint and, and mess around with that if you want uh, back home. Um, and how to assess cold and what to do, right? We're entering the fall. You'll notice everybody that a lot of this has to do with entering the fall season and the, the conditions that we're going to face. Um, can we stop here? Do, do we have questions, Rachel, or, or comments? Do you want to? You know, I don't see any comments other than Terry. Let me know that some of the stuff he he's put out there was just for the hosts and the panelists. Terry, do you mind if I share any of that information? Um, let me know if you'll if you put it in there. Um, but no, we don't have any yet. And you guys are very quiet. Last time, by this time, we were we were uh, uh, really engaging with our audience. So if there's anything going on out there, please I'll tell you. Did you remember? Last yeah. time we had like all these uh, bold points we were going to make and we got to the third one. You remember? Yeah. We were yeah. like, wow, we only got to three. Um, well, then then we'll change gears as we start looking after COVID to getting to more regattas now, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Weather apps was the first one. Um, right. I learned a huge lesson this summer about lightning. I didn't know that lightning could, when it hits, can travel 18 miles. I had no idea that that was thing. So it really made me think about, okay, uh, I need to be more, uh, I, I need to learn more. Like, and so the you know, general thoughts here, are, have you thought about what you need on the water? Uh, have, you, have you balanced out the undue risks? If you know you're in an area, the summer I spent a lot of time in Jacksonville. Jacksonville in the summer is like lightning capital of the world. And that's, I always thought if it's, you know, if you can't hear it or see it, you know, you're good. Well, that's not the truth. It's 18 miles. It can jump 18 to 20 miles. So, you know, I found a great, uh, lightning app, uh, temperature charts, the wind and the direction and are the changes coming, storm uh, cells in the area. Um, one of the head of the fishes, we had, we had uh, five inches of snow, hard and lightning at the same time. And it, of course, waited until the novice uh, left the docks and, and 185 novice boats went down to the start. So of course it waited for that. Um, and then other questions, uh, do this. If you know, if you're checking on this, and there's ifs, if you know there might be something rolling through, if you know, if you recognize the patterns in the, by looking at the sky, and a lot of coaches have done this long enough, you can tell by watching, right? Have you talked to the athletes in advance about proper clothing? Have you talked to them about what ifs? 
if that storm rolls in, this is what we're going to do. Are they aware of what knowledge is in your head as the coach? Are they aware of what you're expecting them to do? Rachel, I mean, you know, long time coxswain, right? I mean, and you deal with a lot of, of um, independent rowers, people who will go out on their own. Like how important is it to know the lay of the land before you leave the dock and, and, and what ifs? I mean, it, it is super important. Uh, you know, I, you gotta know the wind direction because up, just like on any body of water, water how the water is going to be um, performing that morning is gonna be based on direction of wind and strength of wind. And you can have wind that's only going at two miles per hour in a particular direction and, and not have anything. But if it flips direction, that two miles an hour can make the water very choppy and, and not very fun to row in. The other thing is, is fog. I can't tell you the number of times that, that I've gone down to the dock, uh, looked out and went, you know what, we're not going out today. And yet there'll be all of these single scholars and others who will go, ah, we're going to be fine. And they'll, they'll take off and go out. And, and, um, you know, it's, it's like, well, you know, take your cell phone with you, give me a call when you can't find your way back. Right. Type thing. Um, but you know, it's, uh, you, you just, you gotta be safe. You gotta learn these things. And like this morning, Everybody rowing in Seattle was rowing in the Fremont Canal because of the way the, the how, how strong the wind was and the direction that it was coming from. Um, and that just made that we had to be extra vigilant to make sure everybody stayed in traffic pattern. Um, and, uh, you know, because we get into very narrow areas there and traffic pattern is incredibly important. Um, and then my assistant coach didn't realize how cold it was and she was a little cold this morning. So remember, you know, you gotta, you gotta have the extra stuff, uh, to, to keep yourself, um, as a coach safe so that you can keep your athletes safe as well. Hey, what is that saying? There's no, there's no bad weather, just bad clothing choices. Yeah. Something like that. Isn't that something like that goes that is that a Patagonia saying, um, uh, uh moving forward. Cause we're at 743. We're, we're sorry if it feels rushed guys. We're actually trying to make sure that we get a lot of stuff in before we, uh, we get pulled, um, traveling. Trailering and traveling, right? Um, we, we, after a year of not having races, I think everybody was just so excited to race. Um, and, uh, but there are things that we need to take care of before we ever pull out of the lot. Um, hey, uh, Chris, be before you go on, I'm sorry, we did get a question um, okay. and before we move on. So uh, the question comes up about whether clubs and venues have a system to contact rowers if there is a sudden weather emergency um, and do you have a way to monitor the weather? Um, I'll, I'll answer for, um, for uh, me, for my club. Uh, we, uh, we've been using a program called Mind Body um, uh, and also Team Cowboy, but we're going to get rid of Team Cowboy very soon and go to iCrew. iCrew is something that is, um, is an incredible tool to, to get out to people. The problem is, is that if you're already rowing on the water, no, you can't, you can't use it. But if you're trying to prevent somebody from getting to the boathouse, right? You can send out that information to everybody that, that might be coming down. Um, but on the water, we just ask everybody these days to have their cell phones and to pay attention to what's going on around them. I carry a marine band radio always on channel 16 and I will check the weather if it starts uh, moving to the weather channel, if it starts um, getting bad. And then I require all the boats, whether they're coxed or blind boats to have radios in them. So we just have FRS radios so that if we get out of sight of each other, we can get in contact with each other and um, you know, try to get regathered or get to shore or whatever it is that we need to do. Um, Tony, what about you and your club? Well, we do the same thing, but our, our, river, our lake is pretty small at this point. We only have 3000 meters to, to row in at this point, but our big issue is air quality, um, um, to what, to, what that index is for the day. And we usually call it early. If it's over 150 particles per million, then we call it for the day because you can't breathe in it. You can't wear a mask around it. We just call it the issue. And we've had a lot of smoke in the Pacific Northwest over the last six to eight weeks. A lot of smoke. Yep. Many yep. days up to 280. It's just a horrible. AQI yeah. is, on my, is on my app, right? It's the first yep. thing I check in the morning, then the wind, <laughs> right? And then the temperature, so. Right. That's yeah, true. Rachel, you want to tell our, our Tony, you want to tell everybody what that app is so that people can download it because it's it is a very useful tool. Well, I know on WU that's there, but there's also one. With yeah, our put system. it right in the chat. AQI, I think. AQI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Perfect. Okay, Chris, I think that's uh, it. As somebody, and Catherine also, thank you for putting uh, the wind app in there called Windy. I use Sail. Uh, mm -hmm. I, um, it's like nine bucks a year. And uh, it's uh, that gives me two different forecasts that are, you know, so you can kind of look at them and, and, and get pretty, uh, pretty accurate in what's going on exactly where you are. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Tony, thanks for bringing up the air quality. I meant to put that in and it, that's one of those things I forgot. So this was, uh, by the way, this, uh, this uh, slide right here, these were the, um, the 10 most popular weather apps in the country when I, when I Googled it. So that's why you'll see it like that. Um, but I think everybody, I mean, Wonderground, I put that up there because Harry Parker used to do that. And I used to think, well, if Harry Parker's looking at Wonderground, I'm looking at Wonderground too. Um, the uh, uh, traveling. You know, traveling is a big thing, especially in the fall when the roads, you know, I, you know, Catherine, we've had the Heather Fish that have had the mountain passes get snow and you can't make it home and you can't make it over. And I'm sure the Pacific Northwest has had their moments um, with the passes. Um, so uh, the, the big thing about that is, are, are we taking care of the truck and trailer? Like there's a lot, we put a lot of risk there. And I'm not just talking equipment, you know, the drivers and all that. Um, you know, are the inspections up to date? Are the registrations up to date? Do the lights work? Uh, do the running lights work? Do the brakes work, leaf springs, blinkers, um, the tires? I mean, geez, I've, I've never driven through your neck of the woods in the Pacific Northwest or, or the, the, the hills and the mountains up there, but boy, I'll tell you what, it's pretty daunting. Um, do you have the right hitch? Does it fit, the, you know, does it fit right with what you need? I've seen people, you know, jimmy up rigs on their hitches because they're the wrong hitch and you're thinking, oh, you know, it's too small or too big. I mean, that's crazy. Do you have spare fuses in the car? Uh, big I one have here two is trailer. I have two trailer stories, right? Which is something to think about because it's not just the trailer itself, but it's the path you're going to take. It's the route you're going to take. So we had a we had a boat have its bow chopped off because um, the person driving the trailer wanted to take a shortcut, thinking it was a safe route. But there was a reason why we never took that route, and that's because the traffic lights hung down a good two feet lower than any other uh, traffic light anywhere. And of course they go underneath and it catches it just the right way and it just slices the bow right off a boat. Um, and then the other one is going through a particular windy pass where all the other trailers decided not to go through that way, even though it was the most efficient way to get to the regatta. Um, but they all looked at it, looked at the wind predictions and said, no way. And one trailer decided to do it. Sure enough, two of the boats lifted off, flew off, and they were strapped down tight, but they still lifted off, flew off, and, and you know, broke all over the road. So it's important to know your route, and it's important to, to be willing to change that route. Um, even if it's a safe route, change it if the conditions itself are not safe. You know, another thing to, to talk about routes is that um, it took me years to figure out that if you go through New Jersey, you can go through uh, the Turnpike. And what is it? Um, one of the ones you can't have trailers. You can't have things in tow. There's a Turnpike uh, and, and New Jersey Turnpike. Parkways. And, no, and, right. park, no trailers on Parkways. No, no, tra tra no yeah. trailers on the Parkway. And and here I am, Mr. Happy Go Lucky, drive my trailer down, wondering, you know, why we're making great time. Well, there is a reason I wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and a lot of times, if you have GPS, it's sending you on routes. You don't know what's on that route sometimes. Right. And I went to Hamilton College and found out that there were a couple overpasses. Backing up in, in farm country with a trailer because you can't go through the, you know, there's an overpass, you can't go under it. You know, because you're, I remember saying, is my trailer taller than 12 6? Huh. You know, like, well, now we have it on the dash, how tall the trailer is fully loaded, um, in, just in case the question comes up. But equally as important, uh, do you understand the rules of the roads you're traveling, like the turnpikes, right? Like the, the parkways. Um, do you understand the rules for drivers? If you're going to travel across country, once you cross state lines, there, you know, you can't, what is it, 10 hours, 10 and a half hours? You can't go more than? Um, how are your straps? We had a boat blow off uh, this summer going to Sarasota, and we had double strapped it on top. It slid off the sidearm. We didn't, the person mm. didn't tape it, right? It's not that it wasn't tight enough, it slid laterally. Didn't type the, tape the edges. I see Mark Wilson on here. Mark, I'd love to. Mark has driven the trailer more miles than anybody I think I know. I'd love to hear all his crazy uh, trailers. But, um, you know, do you have everything you need to unload and, and, and load it up? 
Um, are you teach? What is your process for teaching the younger athletes how to load the trailer correctly? How to secure things in so that slings aren't flying off on the bridges of Philadelphia? Um, where if things are in the right place? Um, uh, so, do we teach? How do we teach the younger drivers? I mean, is it just like you throw them to the wolves, or do you have a do you have a plan to teach them safely? Uh, Jimmy Joy started doing uh, trailer stuff in his in the parking lot of the Marriott here when he would do the when he would do the Jim Joy conference. He would have trailer. You could go out to the mall and you could learn how to drive a trailer in the in the mall parking lot because in December there's nobody in it. Um, you know, where's your gas? You ever be driving and you look down, and you're like, oh my god, I have no gas. And then you need diesel and you're in South Carolina and it's after 10 o'clock at night and everything you're like. So, I mean, these are just things I put in here. This right here, everybody, is a link. U.S. Rowing used to have a really good trailer page. And it, I found the page. It's just not live. So I put the link here. And like this on the side here, for instance, is a chart of every state in the United States. And what are the trailer specs? What are the regulations? How long can it be? This thing right here where I put flags. In New York State, we have the New York State um, guidelines for our traffic guidelines. But the, the term, who owns uh, I-90 is the interstate is actually all, an Ohio company has been hired to run that. So wouldn't you know it, the flags are different lengths, different widths and different colors that you're supposed to be running off the backs of your boats. The overhang is different. You can't have 10, 10 um, feet combined and you can't have more than four and a half of, uh, in either direction, um, uh, something like that. But so Chris, the, what is what is the chart that you have there on the left hand? Um, uh, this chart on, you'll find yeah. on this link, everybody. This is the trailer regulations chart. Oh, it oh. tells you the, the lengths of the trailers, the lengths of the overhang, um, how wide they can and cannot be. You know, like some places you can, it's eight and a half feet, some places it's, you know, depending on the state, right? So what you see here, each of these columns is giving you specs and it's, it's a lateral uh, row in the state and there's a link to every state's guidelines but I, I mean the vast majority of people that i know have no idea that there are different regulations in different states mm -hmm. um, it's really quick on that there are some really good uh commercial gps apps out there specifically for truck drivers um that if you're in an area with where you're going to be crossing a lot of state borders there are apps that are worth the uh, 10 to 50 dollars a year depending on how how much you travel um i can tell you it was a game changer when i was driving in new york city just having that to be on know you're on commercial safe roads yeah matt do you happen to know could you put that in the uh in the chat for people if you know it off the top of your head yeah okay. um, so Everybody, this link right here will take you to a, a page that is not live, but it has trailer guidelines and it has trailer regulations on it. Um, and so when you go there, that's what you'll find. You'll find two links. One of them leads you to a Google chart like this that, that Willie for Black had made. Us, for those of us who are technologically challenged like myself sometimes, um, he means to cut and paste or to type in that link by when you say it's not live because um, you're not going to find that on our website. We're going to try to get it Correct. rebuilt in there. But the information is available if you type in that, uh, physically type in that link. And, and Rich, I don't want to speak on behalf of the committee, but these are the kinds of projects the committee's looking to sink its teeth into for the future. Correct? I mean, these are the kinds of things we want to do, right? As many information um, links as we can provide that, that <laughs> help our community of rowing out is what we're trying to get out there. Yep, yep. Um, and, and then lastly, um, you know, we put some links in here, our, our COVID updates, like I said, are going to be up sooner, you know, um, the real vector, I mean, the real, the real change for the fall is like, you see the South exploding. Well, it also coincided with when the kids went back to school, right? So there's a lot of interaction happening there. And I think the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic and the Northwest are going to see some similar things depending on how they let the kids go back to school, safe sport, of course, CPR training, of course, um, mental health first aid, uh, safe boating certification, do your clubs require it? Like, do you have, do all of your people have to have it? I, I believe, you know, we're going to say yes. But then there's the gray area of the volunteer coach. Like, how much do they do or do not have to do in terms of certification? Uh, how much do you expect? Um, Catherine had mentioned the wet training earlier. You'll find these on YouTube. I think, Catherine, if you go to this website now, they don't have live links anymore. Um, Richard, oh, you do. might have... Do they no, they do. do. I was playing around on it last night. Okay. So there's three different uh, three different video programs out there on there, but you can also get them all on YouTube. Like okay. you said. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. 
Um, Google Earth Pro, Matt, you had put this on earlier because if you want to take um, and you know a picture over an, uh, a satellite picture of your, you can really get into the G, the, the you know the GPS numbers of great places that are evacuation points along the river. You know if you're going to take out and you have to call emergency mm -hmm. and you don't know where you are, how do you tell them where to come find you? Um, so those were things that I that you could take and laminate in your launch. Um, so you had all the takeout places, right? Uh, rules of rowing. Um, this is the the folder that you'll find everything. That, Anything that's on this webinar or this webinar, you'll find in there. I also put in there, everybody, the FISA World Rowing Guidelines, minimum standards for safe rowing. Uh, I put the Australian, um, their safe sport, or I'm sorry, their safe rowing uh, document is in there and it's outstanding. Um, so those are the two things that you'll find right there. I also put in there something that the New York State uh, Sheriff's Department put together for me, the State Parks and Rec. Uh, rowing and how to interact with the waterways across New York State. And then it, it's a very comprehensive document telling you everything that the state requires to have in the launch, the rules of water, and so on, the Coast Guard regulations. And, um, and they just put it all in one document. You could take that and, and put that into your own state or your own location and just mimic it by using things that are intrinsic to your body of water, right? Yeah. Um, so everything on here is, you know, there's no one right way to do it. There's a lot of ways that you, a lot of things on here that you can compare with to ask, are you doing enough? And Matt said earlier, it, you know, it's a, it's a, a, lot, a, a living document, I think is the word you use, right, Matt? And it should always be getting better, always looking to improve. And Cam said something last night in our meeting, guys, and he said that, you know, each of these things is a connection to action. Like, it's great to have them, but if you're not, if there's not action, like if you're not going out and having the safety meetings with the local coaches, if you're not actively sitting down and having preseason meetings with your staff and making sure that you understand that they understand the rules that you have in place, especially Rachel, you were talking about a new coach in the area last night, and apparently nobody ever told him that you know we have certain rules of the water, and next thing you know, he's turning around in the wrong spot, and everybody who's a local knows but nobody, he's a new coach. Mm -hmm. And so apparently sure. he slipped through. I mean, so the problem with safety is you can't have something slip through the cracks that one time. Right. Hey, Chris, because can we double back for just a moment sure. on one item? Because I think it underlines uh, everything that you're talking about, about connecting plan to at the action. Um, and that is the laminated card that you've mentioned earlier. Yep. And it, you know, in with respect to the Google Maps, um, it is very important uh, from a training perspective, that your coaches understand how to read that card and know what it means. We all, on our respective waterways, refer to things colloquially. So, you know, there's the, the rock that looks like a bear next to the uh, dock that looks like a bridge. Uh, but, but when you call 911, you have to give them a street address. These specifics, they don't know what such and such yacht club is. They don't know what this is or that is or uh, the point where they, you know, the, the grass grows tall. So everything has to be specific. You have to go through it, train for it, um, make your brand new young baby coaches understand what is going to happen when they get on the phone and speak to a 911 operator. Because I don't know about you, I've called 911 on a number of occasions. Even me, with my experience, I get a little flustered and I need to train myself to remember what I have to say. And so- So Catherine, sorry, I just want to remind her, it's five o'clock and we may very well be- Yeah, guys, we, um, I hate to see this. We have to say goodbye because we don't want to hold up the DEI committee on their meeting. Uh, yep. Catherine, you're absolutely right, and um, wish you all well. We'll get we'll get out to you the next steps. The the uh, committee is going to do more, and we have another one coming up. So we'll get that out to everybody who's on this email or on this webinar. We'll get your emails when you've registered. We'll send you out the next steps that we're going to do. I uh, can't you thank can you all enough for joining us. Send us emails on what you want to hear about, right? If there's specific things you want yeah. to hear about, send us an email, and and we'll incorporate that. Uh, uh, safety committee, thanks so much. Everybody who joined us tonight, thank you very much. And uh, we would love to hear um, what you want to hear about next.